All right, Glenn, we are live on video standby for audio. All right, good day and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another Live the Fuel show. So this evening, yes, I have another new co-host for you. It's what we do. And this gentleman has a heck of a background. We're going to have some vibing fun today. I'm just going to give you guys a little teaser. There could be some business. There could be some psychology. Definitely some stuff around health, fitness, and wellness. But let me give you a little more about this gentleman. He's a veteran psychologist and was a longtime CEO of a multi-million dollar consulting firm, which has serviced several Fortune 500 clients in the food industry. So I can't wait to talk more about that. Uh, but you may have seen him in his, uh, his company's previous work, theories and research in major uh, periodicals like the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Chicago Sun-Times, Indiana Star-Ledger, the New York Daily News, American Demographics. Uh, this guy's been in a lot of media outlets. And you may have also heard him on ABC, WGN, CBS Radio, or UPN TV. But long story short, the losing by what traditional psychology had to offer overweight and or food-obsessed individuals he spent several decades researching the nature of binging and overeating via work with his own patients and a self-funded research program with more than 40,000 participants. So this guy just had to do research. So most important, uh, it was his own personal journey out of his own obesity and food prison to a normal, healthy weight and a much more lighthearted relationship with food. So, Make sure you check out his website, Never Binge Again. And without further ado, welcome to the show, Dr. Glenn Livingston, sir. Thank you so much. Please call me Glenn. I will be happy to. PhD aside and all those wonderful accolades, you have been around the block, sir. I, I've been around the block. Yeah, I, I never had kids and I never commuted, so I had a lot of time for my career and I had a lot of passion for what I was doing. So. You and I have more in common then. I mean, because we were just talking before we fired the show that you, obviously you have the marketing background. That's my background. I did not take it to your level of psychology. I only, I was trying to dual major and then realized I wasn't going PhD. So why I finished dual major and just took the minor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I love, I love the alignment of marketing and psychology. I think it's a perfect marriage. Yeah. But I also like you, sir. I, my fiance and I do not want kids. I'm 40. She's 35. I've already taken care of the procedures to ensure that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been thinking about having that procedure, actually, so that's good to know. It's uh, yeah. not that big a deal. Uh, yeah, that's what I thought. Quick tip, do not go on a business trip within a couple of days after the procedure. Give yourself a couple of days to recover. Okay, and you also shouldn't antagonize the person that's going to be doing the procedures, what I've heard. True, true, true. And yeah. they drug you anyway. So, uh, yeah. but totally outpatient, in and out, man, hour flat. So uh, just allow yourself to recover because then you end up in a hotel and there could be some swelling. <laughs> but yeah. let's, get, let's get into this, man. It's not exactly where I thought the conversation was going to go, but I'm, I'm this done. Is the, this is the power of podcasting. You never know where it's going to go. Yeah. So, uh, so you, yeah. So long story short here, you've been out and about a lot. You've definitely developed a group following. You've, I love the fact you did a self-funded research program, by the way, with 40,000 participants. I think there's so much stuff getting thrown out there these days that, you know, er, uh, people who do care are always asking, well, is that backed? Uh, was it a double blind? Yada, yada, yada. What, what do you say to stuff like that? Was that something that oh, was well, well, behind this? I, I mean, the actual study didn't lead me to the right conclusion anyway. It was part of the journey to figuring it all out. Hmm. But um, I think this was not a double blind study. This was an internet study where I recruited people using pay per click advertising over the course of years and years when internet clicks were cheap. So it's kind of an old study, but it had some interesting findings and it facilitated a dialogue and a discussion that led me eventually to an understanding. I can tell you more in the context of my personal story what that actual research found and why it led me to an understanding. Uh, but that's what I say. I don't. And I don't claim, I mean, we are starting to get some research information back about the results of our interventions with Never Binge Again, and they are very effective. So, but, but it's not, it's not a third party study funded and done at Harvard or something like that. It's just a survey of our, our own customers before and afterwards. And so, you know, we can be accused of being biased or profiteering or something like that, but it's better than having no measurement whatsoever because what you measure gets improved mm -hmm. and we've definitely been significantly improving it over time. So. Data can definitely be powerful when used uh, for a mission of good. 
So I, I definitely agree with you on that. And, and real quick, just to kind of add a little more love to your way, just because something says a Harvard study, uh, unfortunately, since launching this podcast show in 2016, and interviewing people way more intelligent than I am, way more resource than I have, and bringing their voices to the masses, I have lost a lot of respect for Harvard studies. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because most of them are paid for. I'm just going to leave it at that as well. So. Yeah. You have, you have to look where the money is. And, but it's better than not having research at all. And so what, what I tell people is that if, if this resonates with you, if it sounds like it might be something different that could help you, then try it out. We'll give you enough information to try it out all by yourself without paying anything for it and see if it works. See if so, it helps you. There's not a real high risk. Since we, since we both value data and obviously your brain, right? The site, never binge again. I'm actually going to do some screen sharing here. So, and you being a marketing guy, I, I love geeking out about branding since we're all about, we're talking about health right now. We're talking about business. We're talking about branding real quick. So clearly there's a big meaning behind never binge again mm -hmm. and, a, and a personal story here. So let's make sure our listeners get that because uh, I, this is a powerful title. Yeah. Well, we actually did a lot of work on the title. The, the personal story is that I was a, an exercise bulimic. When I was 17 or so, I figured out that I could eat whatever I wanted to if I worked out for two or three hours a day. I'm 6'4", I'm reasonably muscular. And you I are, was- You are supposed to export. <laughs> hey, what do you know? And we're both standing, you? ladies and gentlemen. We're both standing. That's good. Yes, yes. I work at a standing desk. Yeah. Same here. Same here. I think we got to be buddies. <laughs> I, and we both had vasectomies. There we <laughs> or, go. Oh, oh, almost. Almost. It's only an awkward, awkward <laughs> common ground now. Totally. It's <laughs> <laughs> the strangest podcast interview I've ever done. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so I had, I had, not. I did not think I had a problem when I was young. I thought it was a really great thing that I could eat whatever I wanted to if I worked out that much. But as I got older, I was 23, 24, I was married, I was seeing patients, I was commuting, but all these responsibilities, I couldn't work out more than an hour or two a week, it was crazy. I found that I couldn't stop thinking about food and I couldn't stop eating you know, 6,000 calories a day. It was just a pattern that I developed and I, I didn't want to stop and I couldn't stop. And it disturbed me because not only was I getting heavier and heavier and the doctors were telling me I could die when I was 35 because every, just about every man in my family had had a heart attack or a stroke and my tri triglycerides were getting up towards a thousand. It was supposed to be like around hundred or 150. Hmm. And, and the doctors were very upset with me telling me I was, I was going to die. More than that, the mental obsession was driving me crazy because I, it's very important to me to be a psychologist. I'm from a family of psychologists. There are 17 of us in the family, therapists wow. and counselors and whatever, um, cousins, aunts, uncles. It's crazy. And that's always who I was first, first and foremost, even when I did all these business things. And I'd be sitting with a suicidal patient. And you have to be really, really present. You have to be totally dedicated to that person if you're going to take that on as a responsibility. And I wasn't present because I was thinking, when can I get to the pizza place? When can I get to the deli? Wow, that's powerful, that's strong. So it was interfering with my integrity. I, I never lost anybody anyway, but it was really interfering with, with my work and my identity. And so being from a family of psychologists, I went to every love yourself thin vehicle that I could imagine. So I went to the best psychologist and psychiatrist and I took medication and I went to Overeaters Anonymous and I read all these books and I did all the soul searching, but none of it really helped me with my eating. It helped me with my personality. It helped me to be a compassionate person. It helped me to know my soul, but it never helped me with the binge eating. And when I wound up doing this study, so I, you know, I was simultaneously to running my clinical practice because I don't have kids and I don't commute. Mm -hmm. I, was, I, I was doing a lot of consulting for big companies and a lot of them were kind of big food companies. And they were paying me a lot of money to do these big studies. And I said, well, if, if these studies are worth so much, maybe I can do one of them to figure it out myself. So I put up a survey on the internet having to do with the foods that people feel like they can't stop eating, the particular foods, and various lifestyle and satisfaction variables, like do they, uh, how happy are they at home, how happy are they at work? And among the things that I found were three convincing patterns. One was that people who started the binges with chocolate and couldn't stop themselves from eating more chocolate, like me, tended to be lonely or brokenhearted. 
that kind of made sense to me because I was in a bad marriage and struggling at the time. People who struggle with salty, crunchy things like chips or pretzels tended to be more stressed at work. And people who struggled with bread or bagels or pasta tended to be more stressed at home. And these weren't perfect correlations by any stretch of the imagination, but there was a pattern. Okay. And so I thought, okay, let me start investigating this pattern in myself and with my patients. And I'll tell you upfront that it, this did not cure the problem. I went to my mom, who's also a psychotherapist, and I said, mom, you know, I found this thing about someone that struggles with chocolate like I do. They say they're lonely and brokenhearted. What is it about my upbringing that could make me lonely and brokenhearted and want to run to chocolate? And she got this, this horrible look on her face, like she's really ashamed. Oh, really? Wow, you actually nailed something here. Yeah. I said, Mom, what is it? She says, well, when you were about one year old, your father, my husband, was a captain in the army, and they were talking about sending him to Vietnam. And I was terrified and overwhelmed. At the same time, your grandfather, my father, had just got out of prison. And I didn't know that he was involved with all these things. He was guilty. And I had loved and adored him my whole life, and I was horribly depressed about that. So I was depressed and terrified all the time when you were one year old, and I didn't have the wherewithal to hold you or hug you or develop a, you know, make a nice meal for you. So I got a bottle of Bosco chocolate syrup, and I kept it in a refrigerator on the floor, and I'd say, Glenn, if you came running to me and you were crying and hungry, I'd say, Glenn, go get your Bosco. And you'd go running over to the refrigerator on the floor, you'd take out the chocolate syrup bottle, and you would suck on it and go into a sugar coma. And I'm really embarrassed. Right. So, so now, Scott, if this was the movies, she and I would have a big hug and a big cry, and I would never struggle with chocolate again. But it didn't work like that. And I found it didn't work like that either with my clients, you know, with, with pasta or bread. Was, was that only for like the first year? Did she say, did it go on for a long time? I didn't go into it too much more with her because she was embarrassed. Oh, yeah. And, it sounds like it was painful for her. Yeah. 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 I mean, I... I remember chocolate being a theme throughout my childhood. I, I have letters that I wrote to her from camp that says, you know, send chocolate or else. Uh, <laughs> I was threatening her that I wanted Nestle's, Nestle's Crunch Bars. And, you know, know, I mean, to pause on that, people who are hearing this, this could be really hitting home for a lot of people. And I, I think when I hear it, not only because I've, only studied it, I geek out about it. And I actually have a regular sports psychologist who comes on all the time. So we do a lot of mindset stuff every single month for our audience. And what I hear is programming, right? Because mm -hmm. I mean, we, we don't know how much longer that lasted for, but at that young of an age, we're sponges. Like you're just, and it's not just a physically what you're being taught and mentally what you're taught, but there's emotionally what you're being mm -hmm. tied to. Mm -hmm. So this is pretty powerful stuff. You're programming that there's a particular emotional trigger and that you go to this particular food to, to solve it when that happens. Hmm. Now, I'm going to tell you that that's a dangerous conclusion for people that overread, and I'll explain to you why in a little bit. Okay. I'll explain to you why now. My mom and I had a big hug. I was a good conversation to have because I was more compassionate towards myself afterwards. I, I no longer hated myself as much for the problems that I was having. I forgave my mother for a lot of things. It led to other conversations about what was going on with my dad and what was going on with her father. And I learned all kinds of things about my history, which were very valuable and soulful for me in my personal journey. But it didn't solve the chocolate problem. The reason it didn't solve the chocolate problem is because there was this little voice in my head. And that voice went something like this. Hey, Glenn, you know what? You're right. Your mama didn't love you enough. And she left a great big chocolate-sized hole in your heart. And until you can find the love of your life, you better go right on binging on chocolate. Let's go get some right now. Yippee. And it, it's like there was a voice of justification that seized on the emotional conflict and said, okay, now we know the mass has struck the fire. You're doomed until you can find the love of your life. You might as well. Wow. Same thing I found with people struggling with, uh, with stress at work and, and salty, crunchy things or stress at home and bread and pasta and bagels. Same thing. Right? Until we can get the man's boot off our neck and develop our own business, so we're going to have to go right on crunching. Same type of thing. At the same time, I was studying some alternative addiction treatment literature because I had tried Overuse Anonymous, and it was like 
probably around 260 pounds at that point. I try to lose it. Yeah, I'm like 208 right now. That's the same, man. You look lean and mean, bro. Yeah. No, I, I, and I, I work out a lot now and I yeah. take really good care of myself and I eat mostly fruits and vegetables and you know, I, I'm, I'm off the junk. Mm -hmm. I'm off the junk. I don't recommend that everybody gets off the junk. I'm, my book is Diet Agnostic. We'll work with you no matter what you eat, but that, that's okay. I'll recommend that everybody gets off the junk. <laughs> <laughs> I, I set the bar annoyingly high according to my fiance. So, uh, well, well, here's here's the problem, Scott. The, the junk has a life of its own. If you look at what's happening, if you look at what's happening inside the big food companies, and I'm embarrassed that I did all the work for them. Hmm. They're engineering these food-like substances. They're, they're hyper palatable concentrations of starch and sugar and fat and they're oil. Driving addiction. They're driving addiction. And it's actually, to be fair, because I've interviewed very, very many, many experts on healthy fats, and it's, it, that's not the issue. Fat is not the issue at all. It's the sugar. It's that addiction, man. That, yeah. And oh, they, they have figured out the perfect formula and that flavor profile to hit all those triggers. And yeah. And, and you, as a psychologist, you could probably back this up. Like, sugar is more addicting. Is that is this is this casual slogan true? Sugar is more addicting than cocaine. I mean, that's been for they, a they, while. There's a couple of studies that showed that rats had more trouble getting off of sugar than getting off of cocaine. Yeah, but then, I think the important thing here that I've learned a lot too in the past two years is is also the tie to your hormonal alignment. We've had a lot of hormonal gurus and geneticists on there, and they tie that science together with this. So you got. What we're hearing from you is all this mental stuff, and then you got a big, big business with the perfect formulation for you know physical addiction, the flavor profiling, and then obviously the sec the, the, the and the triggers to our hormones getting all thrown off, and it's, mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a bomb, man, going off in the body. It's, it's a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle. Yeah, and, and the impact. What they're really doing is short circuiting the pleasure machinery in your neurological system. And the impact of doing that in mammals was shown in a whole series of studies going way back to the 50s. Milner and Olds, I think, were the doctors that did it to start with. And then they started with rats and they replicated it up the chain. When they put an electrode in a rat's brain in the pleasure center and they wire that electrode directly to a lever that the rat could push, the result was that the rat would push it, rats would push it thousands of times per day to the exclusion of their survival needs. So starving rats would push that button thousands of times per day to the exclusion of food, which would have saved them from starvation. Huh. Mother, mother rats would abandon their nursing pups to go push the button thousands of times per day. Rats would crawl over painful electrical grids to push that button thousands of times per day. I don't, so, so the result in a mammal, when you short circuit the pleasure machinery, and make a mistake about it, offering these concentrations of, you know, sugar and starch and oil and more, more the sugar and starch, like you said, and excitotoxins, you're short-circuiting the pleasure machinery. The result is self-neglect. The result is extreme self-neglect. And that's why, go on, I'm sorry. I was going to say, why, why the extreme? I, I think that key word really stood out to me just now because I'm, I'm an adrenaline junkie, so I, <laughs> I admit to those addictions, uh, adrenaline-wise. But, like, why an extreme? Neglect. Well, because someone might take me to task on this, so I, I don't think to be 100% oh, scientifically podcast, accurate. Man. We got to get your yeah. opinions out here, your truths. I mean, so maybe. my understanding is that these companies are targeting your lizard brain. They're targeting the survival mechanisms in your lizard brain. They want you to feel like you can't live without their food. And so that, that's why you have people saying, just hand over the chocolate and nobody gets hurt. That, that, that's why people wow. can read a book over the weekend, decide they're going to go in this diet, and then Monday afternoon when they're you know, standing at Starbucks and there's a big carry chocolate bar in front of them, they hear this little voice that says, you know, chocolate comes from a cocoa bean and that grows on a plant, and so chocolate's really a vegetable. Hmm. You, you, it's, not, it's not a logical part of our brain. It's, it's a survival drive. And the intention is to make people feel like they can't live without it. And these foods have a life of their own once you go past the addiction point. They really have a life of their own. I, I love that you just tied this to the lizard brain, uh, only because literally as we're recording this last this past weekend, I was outside of Philadelphia at a three-day conference uh, called the Millionaire Mind Intensive. Mm -hmm. We were doing a lot of mental work 
around um, the T. Harv Eker. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, well, it's stemming from him, but the speaker was Doug Nelson, who is the author of um, Catch Fire because he literally blew himself up in a house by accident and like oh. melted his whole body. Powerful, powerful. Um, but anyway, yeah, exactly his teachings. But they talked a lot about the lizard brain and how trying to reprogram that and and break that of its of its survival you know instincts is pretty powerful stuff. It takes a lot of work. Yeah. And it's also the reason that I believe that trying to love yourself out of an addiction is the wrong way to go about it. Mm. I actually got this reading Jack Trimpey's work, Rational Recovery. And what I took from that was an understanding that the lizard brain is very distinct from the rest of our human brain. Okay. The lizard brain looks at something in the environment and says, do I eat it, do I meet with it, or do I kill it? Eat, mate, or kill. There's no love there. There's no long-term aspirations or goals or strategies. There are no weight loss plans there. Mm -hmm. There's no concern for tribe or family. There's no creativity. There's no spirituality. There's no contribution to society. It's just eat, mate, or kill. So if your paradigm at the moment of impulse is that, oh, you're feeling this craving, you must need to love yourself more. What's happening is most people open themselves up more and try to integrate the lizard brain at that moment. What you want to do instead is act more like an alpha wolf and see this as a member wolf of the pack challenging for leadership. And if you think about how an alpha wolf acts at the moment of challenge, it snarls at the challenger and the attitude is basically get back in line or I'll kill you. It's not an attitude of love. It's an attitude of domination. And that's usually much more instantaneous. That's a, that's a flash. That's an explosive. Yeah. Very aggressive. Mm -hmm. It's very primitive. It's very early in terms of our evolutionary history that that developed. Okay. So the problem at the moment of impulse is that we're trying to operate from our logical human brains, but our logical human brains are not really awake enough. And you can get control by using, this is the embarrassing part because I'm a sophisticated psychologist and I've done tens of million dollars of research and I've got all these credentials and everything, but after 30 years of trying frickin' everything, I mean everything I could to get over the food addiction, what worked for me was saying, my lizard brain, I'm gonna call that my inner pig. I'm not talking about a real pig, I'm talking about a mental construct. Real pigs need our help in the world, but I'm talking about my inner pig. I'm gonna draw lines in the sand. So just like I was addicted to drugs, I wanna have really clear healthy versus unhealthy behavior. So I'll say, I will never eat chocolate on a weekday again. If I hear a little voice in my head that says I should eat chocolate on a Wednesday, I decided that that's pig squeal. The chocolate itself is pig slop. And I would say, I don't eat pig slop. I don't know the farm animals tell me what to do. And it would assert my superiority. It was a very primitive, very crude technique. And it wasn't a miracle. But little by little, I found I was waking up at those moments of impulse to remember who I was and the kind of person I wanted to be around chocolate, around you know, pasta and donuts or whatever it was that I needed to control. And slowly but surely, I was restoring my hope and enthusiasm. And that's my story of recovery. I, I kept a journal about me versus what the pig said for eight years. I eventually wow. published it on a whim. Now we have 500,000 copies distributed and it's often the number one book for weight loss and the candle free side. So um, that's impressive. it obviously resonates, yeah. So, because I'm all about mindset. I mean, it's funny because my tagline is, you know, health, business, lifestyle. But as this show has grown and as we get more and more powerful uh, co guest co-hosts who come on like yourself to share the wisdom, it, there's so, I can't tell you, I mean, almost, I don't want to say every single show nowadays, but I'm constantly being drawn back to mindset, the mental game. I feel like that's almost one of the biggest challenges over everything. That's what I'm hearing from you anyway. Yeah. But solving it turned out to be simple. So if I can take you all the way back to the emotional story with my mom, yeah. it would take me 20 years to find the love of my life to solve the chocolate problem, right? That's one way I could go about solving it. Get rid of the loneliness and, and heartbreak inside. Sure. The other way is to disempower that crazy voice. It's, it's akin to building a better fireplace rather than putting out the fire or being more of a... Um, fireman than a, than a detective. The reason why doesn't matter as much. I mean, it's important, but you don't have to figure out why. You can just 
find a way to disempower this course. What, what you're really doing, when I went back and I reviewed the research on willpower and, and mindless eating and that type of thing, what you're really doing is you're building character to trump willpower. So if, if you permit me, I'd like to explain that. Oh, please, please do. So what we know about willpower from all the latest research is that it's not like an on and off switch that some people have and other people don't. It's more like gas in the tank. And there are only so many good decisions you can make over the course of the day. What burns willpower is decision making. Not only decisions about food, people have trouble resisting marshmallows after we make them do math problems. <laughs> it's, all, it's all the decisions that you make over the course of the day. It's do I report this email to spam? Do I delegate it? Do I defer it? Do I put it on my to-do list for later? Do I respond to it right now in detail? How do I respond to that? That's burning a little tiny piece of your willpower in your brain. You can restore that willpower by taking self-care breaks, another five or 10 minutes during the day to take a breath, do some yoga, walk outside, replenish your blood sugar, keep it nice and even during the day. That, that will help you with your willpower. Um, ultimately, if you're someone who eats, who breaks down at night most of the time, you want to start making your food decisions in the morning. Get on some Tupperware, plan out what you're going to have at night, oh, write yeah. it out, put it on the fridge. Yeah. 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 Um, but what we're really doing with these rules is we're eliminating decisions. See, up until this point, most advice in our culture suggests that we use guidelines for food as opposed to rules. Guideline might be something like, I avoid chocolate 80% of the time. Okay. As opposed to, I will never have chocolate on a weekday again. The problem with saying I avoid chocolate 80% of the time is that when you're in front of that chocolate bar every time, you have to make a decision, is this part of the 80% or part of the 20%, you're wearing down your willpower. Hmm. If you say, I'm not the kind of person who eats chocolate during the week, what you're really doing is eliminating decisions vis-a-vis -a, -vis a character trait you've decided to adopt. To really illustrate that, let me show you how easy it is to follow character versus willpower. Imagine you walk into a diner and there's a $20 bill on the table because the waitress has not seen her tip. And she says, I'll be right back. I just have to get your menu. And there's no video camera, there's nobody up front. Nobody would see you take it. There's no window, nobody would see you take it. Virtually everybody I ask about the scenario says there's no way they would take the tip. And I'll say, why? And they'll say, well, that woman worked hard for her money and it's not mine. And I'll say, so? And they'll say, well, I'm not a thief. And I say, aha. So as a matter of character, there's a decision you've made without even knowing it that mm -hmm. says, you don't have to make a decision in this situation. You don't have to exert your willpower. You're not a thief. End of story. Which is most of I'm our not, upbringing. Which is most of our upbringing. Mm -hmm. We don't run out into the street and, attract, and kiss attractive women just because they're attractive or attractive men. We don't, um, we don't pee in our grandmother's living room. We, we have a very strong urge, but we go in a very particular place. At yeah, a very it's, particular just, it's a little awkward, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, my mother-in-law, I thought about doing it a couple of times. <laughs> Ex-mother-in-law. Oh, um, wow. You know, we are conditioned to adopt character traits, which are habitual ways of behaving in the face of certain stimuli, without even thinking about it. What I'm suggesting, what we've discovered, is that you can eliminate the need for willpower by thinking through what rules you want to follow, what character traits you want to follow, who you want to be, what role you want that food to serve in your life beforehand. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the best defense that we've found against you know, the food industry and the advertising industry and the addiction treatment industry and all of the overwhelming forces that are coming at us trying to get us to look for love in the bottom of these bags and boxes and containers. Wow. So I, I have an interesting, well, two things I, that, that I want to make sure we get this out because I want to block you. One, I love the fact you connected to firefighting because I'm a former firefighter. So oh, okay. They, they, I'm not, but yeah. That's okay, but you buy with me because, uh, where, where do you live, by the way? You're... I live in Portland, Oregon. I grew up in New York and I spent 14 years in New Hampshire. Okay. Yeah, so I, I live in Pennsylvania, but I used to serve out west in uh, based out of Arizona. But I was on one of the U.S. Forest Service hotshot while in firefighting crews. So we got sent around to all the big big stuff. But as you still, the point here is, as you started to explain this, uh, you know, a few minutes ago, I made a connection to like that shock value 
and through that job or through that, you know, that two year adventure, uh, learning that, you know, fire is not a bad thing, right? You don't need to stop it. You need to surround it. You need to study it. Mm. And, that, and then we actually used fire to fight fire. Like we actually literally would set things on fire ahead of time to, to, to alleviate that, that danger zone. So when the fire did finally get there, we had already removed the fuel that would have allowed it to escape. Interesting. Interesting. So, yeah. I, I just figured you would geek out with that a little bit. So <laughs> people, are like, well, how, people are like, how do you put out wildfires? I'm like, you don't. I'm like, what do you mean? I was like, you, you put a perimeter around it. Mm -hmm. like, wild and firefighting was like, I went from the cubicle life in the corporate world here to that for two years. So it was like, Oh, this is all manpower, horsepower. Yeah. You'll see helicopters and planes dropping red stuff. Those are just retardants to slow the burnability. But in the mm. end, to truly, to truly contain a wildfire, something out of control, and I just want to find a way to make this connect for you, is you must get manpower around it. You must build a perimeter, the fire break, through digging, mm. chainsaws, and that and all. And then, then we would burn off of the, of the line you know, to the side of the fire zone. We call it the black yeah. And the other side is the green. We don't want the green to burn. We want the black to burn. So there's we thin the fuels. And if we have time to help pull the fire away from that perimeter, once the fire is close enough, we would set fire to that edge with, uh, with fuel cans. And then the power of the main fire would draw the, the, the new fire towards it. So it actually pull the fire away from us, mm -hmm. uh, burning that minimal fuel that we left there. So we kept it low and controlled. So just, I don't know, I just... I, no, it's, it's, I think it's a really good metaphor because yeah. most of our culture cultivates fear of the emotional triggers for overeating. Hmm. Pe and people walk around believing that I'm very upset, therefore I need to find comfort. I need to find comfort foods. It, it totally ignores the idea that these foods get you high. <laughs> these, are not, these are not natural things that comfort, are meant to comfort you, the things that actually get you high. I mean, chocolate's a drug and sugar's a drug and flour's a drug. It's, it's pretty amazing. But ignore that for the moment. Mm -hmm. In order for the emotion to create a binge, first it creates a desire to binge, mm -hmm. but then there's got to be a little voice in your head that justifies it, even if you don't hear that voice, even if that voice is just some small element of, um, oh, screw it, we already blew it, let's just you know, start again tomorrow. There's always a voice of rationalization that makes it okay. The reason there has to be that voice of rationalization if you took the time to define what's healthy versus unhealthy, where you actually drew the line, is because it's not gonna be okay with your ego. It's not gonna be okay with your conscious perception of yourself to just let that happen unless you can find some reason to justify it. Hmm. And so the additional fuel that would keep that fire burning and make it get out of control is actually the rationalization that up until the point that they take the time to focus on it, most people don't recognize is there at all. So I'm not sure I can go all the way with the fireman's analogy, but what you're really doing is you're, you're burning out that fuel of rationalization so that the emotions can't make the leap into actual behavior. And then it's fine. It's perfectly fine if you're upset or depressed or anxious. I mean, the other thing I tell people in those situations is, look, if you have seven problems and then you overeat, then you have eight problems. Like the overeating is not going to make it any better. It's not going to comfort you. It's not going to fix the problem. So try to remember that as a mantra. But more importantly, find the rationalizations that are making it possible for those emotions to turn into binges, disempower those rationalizations by disputing them and or ignoring them, and then you'll be fine. And the word we used often was mitigate that, right? We're, we're trying to mitigate the situation. We can't remove it, okay? Mother Nature has decided to launch some lightning down from the sky and set that tree on fire. And then by the time we found it and you know, relative humidity drops and the winds increase, you've got a wildfire with thousands of acres. Can't change it. Okay. <laughs> it's off. It's out. It's like, okay, now you're going to come in, find a safe way to get around it, deal with the fuels at hand and obviously keeping everybody safe, find a way to mitigate the situation and calm it down and mm -hmm. allow it to run its course. But so again, there's, there's really no true way to control the wildfire. Let's be real. People get killed every single year. Very dangerous profession. That's why I don't do it anymore. Uh, but it, I, it taught me a lot. And I think the biggest word that I was connecting on you, obviously not your vernacular, but I'm, I'm like mitigation, man. Find ways to mitigate it. 
that works with the situation. Yeah. Well, in, in this situation, the drive comes from our need to survive. It's actually part of the fight and flight response. And we can't, we can't excise the lizard brain from our head. We need the lizard brain to drive our survival. Oh yeah, survival it, is everything. It's just that it's been corrupted by industry and it's, it's been justified by these hidden rationalizations that most people are not aware of, but sometimes they are aware of them, they do them anyway. So you actually want to cultivate a respect for and a desire to feel those cravings. First of all, you can't cure a craving without experiencing a craving. You have to experience the craving and either feed it what it authentically needs, not what the industry says that it needs, or you need to ignore it so that you attenuate the addiction. You can't just one, two, three, say, well, I'm never going to have a craving again because you're, you're going to have a craving. It's like telling a Doberman pincher not to lunge after a rib roast. See, this is why I'm so against the disease model. I do not believe that overeating is a disease. I believe that overeating is a healthy appetite that's been corrupted by industrial food. Well, let's be real. If, if overeating was a disease, then I've got it. Because, yeah. I, because I can sit down and now I can't actually, I, I'll correct myself. I can try to overeat, but then eventually because of the nutrient density and the way the profile is built, for example, steak. I can sit down, have a beautiful grass fed steak. I might even have a second one, but getting that second one in is going to be hard to do because I'm so, I'm a big ketogenic supporter, fat adaptation. I have no sugar in my life, no grains. It's taken me a couple of years to get to this point that's powerful because fat is fuel. It's a long burning energy and your brain is fat. And it's like, dude, if you're not feeding healthy fats like avocado, alcohol, oil, or anything else, like your brain is starving. Whole different conversation. My point is, though, is like there's two key hormones that are constantly a battle, the hunger hormones, leptin and ghrelin. Well, the beauty of eating rich, dense fat and nutrient dense, you know, food, whole food, not manufactured crap, is your your hormones will respond and be like, oh, guess what, bro? Like you, you gave me all I need. I'm good. <laughs> uh, you're eating sugars and grains and manufactured formulas. They're they found a way around those hormone alignments and they're getting you to keep going on all the yeah. crap. It's not a disease. Yeah. It's not. <laughs> yeah. It can be proven yeah. with science. <laughs> yep. And I, and I love pause on this because there could be a listener out there or two, and I, I want to respect them. Uh, what if they get upset with what you and I are saying here, right? I mean, we're not. Well, there, there are a lot of people that get upset with what I'm saying. Right, and right. Look, if you're in a 12 step program and it's working for you to believe that it's a disease, then I think that's perfectly fine. I, I don't want you to come out of the program, but I, I don't think it's ethical to tell people that it's a disease in the absence of evidence that, that it's a disease. I, mm. I have not seen a shred of decent evidence that it's a disease. And in the absence of that, I think that it's dangerous to tell people that it is. So I think it's fine if you want to stay in the program. I don't think it's fine to go recruiting other people into the program and lie to them that it's a disease and that they're helpless and powerless and it's a chronic, progressive, mysterious disease that they have to, you know, follow this spiritual program for the rest of their life. I, I don't think that's fair. What, what frustrates me, and I, I could be going on to a very spicy subject right now, um, on that topic is this issue around mental illness. And this could become a whole episode. We might have to have you back on. <laughs> but again, your tagline, never bitch again, right? Reprogram yourself to think like a permanently thin person and think, reprogram. Mm -hmm. Keywords are reprogram. Think, ladies and gentlemen, okay? So my point here is this. Um, depression is a big mental mm -hmm. qu quote disease. Mm -hmm. um, I have a sister who have suffered from it for years. Um, I found out that my mother's father suffered from it because he lost his hearing in a manufacturing job years ago. And people used to make fun of him. This is like decades ago, right? I never met the gentleman. He passed away before I was ever known. Um, I found out but we moved around a lot and at one, one home we lived in, I found out later my mom was very depressed living there because it was so far removed. She couldn't do a lot of things she wanted to do. I had no idea. It made her a little depressed. Um, I had a bad breakup many, many, many years ago. And I finally got my first little taste of, you know, being like, I actually went to a psychologist. I, I don't talk about this. I don't care. I hide nothing on the show. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, Oh, I, I took antidepressants, hated it. Like I said, I, I got into that whole fire thing. This is years ago. I'm like, Scott, pull your head out of your ass and figure this out. I was like, drugs are not the answer. I've never been a drug guy. It's just a pharmaceutical band-aid 
there's something here that you're not dealing with, work through it. And then obviously I went back to school on nights and weekends and did my degree in marketing and psychology. Gee, I wonder why I decided to target psychology. <laughs> yeah, we're all trying to cure ourselves, right? Because I don't, I don't yeah. like not knowing the answers and yeah. I will learn about it. So I wanted yeah. to share that with you because I also think it's important for the listeners to know that, yeah, I'm this crazy, I do public speaking now and I got a podcast, blah, blah, blah. Guess what? I'm a freaking human being and I've gone through some stuff too. Well, I, I have also, I've suffered with depression also. And I, I want to be really clear for people listening that there is evidence that depression is neurochemical. Mm. There is evidence that it's um, you know, genetic in some ways. There is evidence that it can be caused by life, exper yeah, life experiences. Yeah. And so and, and when I work with people with depression in my clinical practice, which Never Binge Again is not a clinical practice, it's coaching and education because I'm, I'm outside the standards of care for my profession. Sure. I, I, don't, I don't agree with a lot of things my profession is saying, although it's starting to kind of coalesce. Um, but when I work with depression, for example, in my clinical practice, I do encourage people, if necessary, to take medication for a period of time. I, I think that sometimes it can be life-saving, and I, I wouldn't want people to get scared away from that. That's different than addiction. I don't think there's any evidence that addiction is a disease. Mm -hmm. I think that it, addiction, the word actually means the love of, and it's, um, it's, it's like a... It's like a substance enhanced stupidity. It's re repeating the same thing um, with a very bad result based upon the toxic pleasure that it produces. But it's something that people do have control of and have the ability to. You're looking at the Instagram account. We're actually not working that actively right now, but you're welcome to follow us there. Yeah, but there's great, there's great feed on here. I wanted to do some sharing for your video while you're telling us this stuff. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. You know, people get a lot of help on the Instagram account and. Um, they connect with us there, so I'm happy to have you there. We'll, we'll be back on and working that exhaustively probably in 2019. So, yeah. The good, the good thing is you've got good standard content. Ladies and gentlemen, who's, who's hearing this and not seeing this, um, his Instagram feed, I'll have this link in the show notes like I always do on livingfield.com, uh, but he's at Livingston Glenn. So, but the good thing is he doesn't have like selfie photos. He doesn't have... Uh, like it's not a lot of food picks. Like most of his stuff on here is, I, I'd like to call these like little like tips templates. Like he's got a targeted topic and then bullet points and obviously a fun little graphic on each one. But like, I mean, one real quick is avoid, you know, journaling to avoid binge eating. I'm sorry, using journal to avoid, you know, binge eating. Uh, and tips in here, like most binges are fueled by seemingly logical reasons, uh, stress reduction, rewards, sadness, everything you're talking about today. So I just, again, I like some people are driven by imagery um, I'm sure you're familiar with the back method, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, dot, mm -hmm. body, what, so, mm -hmm. when, so it's like, okay, some people might be visual. Maybe they need that in their lives to start making yep. change. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, by the way, please cool. continue. Well, I mean, what's left to talk about really is some practical instructions for people to get started with this if they want to. And what I like to start people off with is the question, what's the single worst trigger food or eating behavior in your life. What one trigger fruity behavior could you either regulate, eliminate, or control in some way that would make a dramatic difference in your life? And I don't care if that's going to cause you to lose weight or not. I just want you to be able to draw a line in the sand and then listen for your inner pig. You don't have to call it a pig. You can call it your inner food monster or your inner food demon or sure. someone would call it their inner B-A-T-C-H. If, mm -hmm. Listen, listen for your inner you whatever. Stuff here, by the way, too. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. This is not a well, kid show. <laughs> yeah, I have to train myself not to say it because I got a call from the Dr. Oz show the other day, and I, God forbid, I go on something like that, and then I, uh, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. You got to put in the clean reps. <laughs> yeah, just just one mistake and you're dead. So so, draw one line on the sand. Listen for everything that your inner pig says to talk you out of it. And then when you hear it say, well, I don't want that, my pig does. And I don't listen to farm animals tell me what to do. I don't need pig slop, I don't let my farm animals tell me what to do. As crazy as that sounds, that'll wake you up and help you remember who you are and why you wanted to change this behavior in the first place. And see if that doesn't give you just a little more control. See if it doesn't give you a little more hope. And if it does, then you know, try, try another rule, study what I'm doing a little more closely. Um, I can tell you when we're done where to get the book for free. And that's what I have to offer. 
Yeah, Probably. after all these years, that's what I have to offer. Well, and actually, that's a great reminder. I'll, I'll go ahead and do some screen sharing again because uh, for the ladies and gentlemen that are listening and not watching, um, I I'm happy to have you guys watch on YouTube, but I'm always happy for the regular audio listeners out there. But again, neverbingeagain.com is his site. And when you visit it, he's got a free ebook on here. So it is an ebook, right? Or is it a physical book? Well, uh, you can get a free copy of the Kindle Nook or PDF if you click on the big red free bonus button on the home page. That'll take you to this page. Mm -hmm. When you sign up for that, you not only get a copy of the book, but you will get a full set of food plan starter templates. So we took a lot of time to think through what sets of rules people might want to use for you know, low carb versus high carb versus point counting versus macrobiotic or vegan and whatever dietary philosophy you might be on, we took some time to think through a set of starter rules that you might consider. I call them starter templates because I want you to take responsibility for your own food. I don't want, I don't want your pig to be able to say, well, Gwen told me to eat this and it didn't work, so therefore, let's go to town. No, let's take responsibility for your own food. You've been reading about this, you're following what Scott, you're probably doing a ketogenic approach. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole bunch of other things you'll get. Probably the most important one, in addition to the Kindle PDF or, or Nook copy, is a, a set of recorded coaching sessions. This is a little weird in theory. When Scott and I talk about it, you might think I'm a little crazy. But if you listen to how it's actually coached in practice and you listen to people overcoming their sense of hopelessness or powerlessness or inability to stop overeating in one session, you'll get really excited and enthusiastic and inspired and hopefully it'll make a difference in your life. Um, NeverVisionAgain.com, click the big red free bonus button and sign up for the uh, reader bonus list. You'll get all that. If you want a physical copy of the book, you'll see how to get that when you're there. And if you need to contact me directly, you can also hit the contact button. I get those eventually. It might take a day or two before it gets through my customer service people. So yeah, and I, I love it. it. You, you have so much. Uh, I truly believe this from a marketing standpoint. I tell people, give away your best stuff. Because I think that truly starts to build the relationship, but it shows you're not messing around. And oh yeah, on, on video sharing on here, I mean, hit, hit, ladies and gentlemen, when you first go to the, you know, when you click on the red button, you first see the book. Scroll down. There's a huge bullet point list of all the stuff he's talking about. And I love the fact you're giving away the the, uh, the, the MP3s on there because back to that back method, visual, auditory, kinesthetic. Some people maybe are driven by your Instagram feed visually. Other people might need not just podcasts but dedicated audio content that you've created to build that consistency and put those reps in. They might need to have that stuff saved on their phone. That's the only thing they listen to for the next two, three months. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, have, we have 20 or 30 videos on our YouTube channel also. Me just there you go. Talking, cool. talking you through stuff, yeah. 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 So, I mean, and, and so again, hitting two out of the three right there, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, that, I think that'd be a lot easier for you to start implementing that kinesthetic and going through the process and physically getting involved with the content that he's helping share with you. Uh, I, Again, I geek out on psych. I warned you about that, Glenn. I was going to totally have fun with this episode today because I think what you've created here is awesome. And you haven't, by the way, and this isn't a, this isn't a bust. This is actually true. You haven't overdone it with like flashy marketing and like trying too hard. Uh, mm -hmm. I love the graphics. I, I think it's simple and clean. And it's like, okay, it shows that you actually focus on the content and yeah. what's going into it and not, ooh, I've got this you know, really high quality graphic design and makes us something. Da da dancing right. bears and whistles and stuff like right, that. Right, right. Yeah. It's like, yeah. uh, no people, yeah. I'm trying to get you to never binge again. My, my goal is to help a million people a year stop over again. That's my goal. Wow. Wow, so, so here's the best part. I usually have you close out, the, the co-hosts close out the show with the final words uh, to leave behind. So maybe that's our closing comments? I don't know. I mean, do you have anything more powerful than that to leave behind with that? Or I, a couple of things. I would say that I would combine two quotes from two of my favorite authors. One is Jim Rohn who said, a life of discipline is better than a life of regret. The other one is Peter McWilliams who said, you can have anything you want, you just can't have everything you want. This, this is about building very specific disciplines one at a time to make you into the kind of person that you want to be around food. Life of discipline is better than a life of regret and you can have anything you want but you can't have everything you want. So take the time to do this make a big difference in your life. Hope that it helps. Oh man, this has been powerful. Thank you, those are powerful words. Here, stand by, I'm gonna give you a proper goodbye up the air. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Dr. Glenn Livingston, neverbingeagain.com. It's free content, people. Take advantage of it, okay? Go visit the site, click on the big red button, and get some content. And maybe you'll need to get it for you. Maybe there's somebody you know in your life that could be struggling. And I truly believe in this cheesy quote for myself, you know, sharing is caring, okay? Stop. Some people don't want to hear you tell them, but if you hear that they're looking for resources or content out here, take advantage of this type of stuff. And you don't have to reference it. Remember, all this stuff's going to be linked in the show notes. So you can always come back, willyflow.com, and you'll get this stuff. So again, thanks for tuning in to another powerful mindset, health, fitness, just we even tagged a little marketing in there. I think we hit on everything. So I loved it. Another great, powerful Live the Fuel podcast show. Check out Never Binge Again. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, you too can live the fuel. Talk to you guys again soon. Thank you, Scott. All right, you are free of the pod. I just need the video <laughs> on for extra extra fun. Oh, okay. Behind the scenes. So. Okay, great. I'm going to have to go in a minute, but if you let yeah. me know when this is published, I'll get you some traffic. Absolutely. I um, I always email. I always, yeah, I, I'm a professional. Okay. I will always yeah. email you back. I'll send you the links. Uh, I'm usually about, I think I'm at least still two weeks out. That's right. Our show, the show's already booked, so done. No problem at all. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you'll definitely be up in, within within 30 days. So, yeah. So uh, someday I might want to just talk to you about business, Jim. Absolutely. I, I love it. Okay. I, I love this. I can't believe I never came across you before yet. So cool. kudos to whoever helped set this up. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Okay, man. Well, it's nice to talk to you. Nice talking to you. Have a great day. See you soon. Okay, you too. Bye. Bye.